Good morning, everyone. This is John. John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, uh, Understanding Our New World. And today we're totally delighted to be joined by one of my favorite historians now working in the United States, Alexis Coe. Alexis is a native of California, uh, went to undergrad at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, went to graduate school at Columbia and Sarah Lawrence, had a couple uh, jobs we'll talk about working in the kind of research area um, she's been a consultant for the History Channel. Uh, you might see her on CNN doing some commentary. She's hosted uh, two wonderful podcasts and is also the author of two terrific books, which I highly recommend. The first one is called Alice and Frida Forever, uh, A Murder in Memphis, which is becoming, I think, a movie. We'll talk to her about that. And the second one is called You Never Forget Your First, a biography of George Washington. This was published last year to rave reviews and was on a lot of lists for best books of 2020. So Alexis, so good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for such a, a thorough introduction and that you know you really did your homework, so thank you. Well, great, thank you. Well, Alexis, we had an interview a couple of weeks or a couple of months ago with Margaret McMillan, the, the historian, and I asked her, so you know, when, when did you get first bitten by the history bug? And she kind of smiled. She said, well, when I was a little girl, it was sort of between ice skating and ballet and history. And I sort of thought maybe my career prospects might be a little better in history, but then went on to say how much she just loved the, the kind of adventure of exploring lives and doing kind of a deep dive into a past. When did you first think about becoming a historian? How did you get into this? It's so interesting. That's a great story. I think there were two moments like that um, in which I do think that people who love great stories, who are great readers, love history. Um, and I always say, you can't make this stuff up. The drama that, um, you know, is is sort of natural to life is so much better than anything you can read in a book. Um, and I stand by that. But it, it actually, in both instances, came from a love of fiction. I'll go, um, I'll, I'll be anachronistic here. I'll go out of order. So I, I when I was in college, I was very interested in, in, I got swept up in Irish literature my first year. I thought it was so exciting. And I ended up writing my um, undergraduate thesis. I was in the honors program. So you get to sort of work with a, with a professor. It goes on the British system when you're a part of this. Um, in California has a whole system. And if you do really well, you can pick which school you want. And then you can pick your honors college. And it's just, it's great. You can register for classes, you know, months in advance grad school privileges but um so I took classes and I really wanted to understand in order to understand Irish literature you need to know Irish history but even with all those privileges I still had to take sort of the basic history classes to get to the Irish literature you know Irish history classes I was hooked you know two weeks into an American history course a general course I knew that I had to somehow you know, balance these two loves. And by the end, I stuck with that, that thesis, but by the end I double majored and I was assured that it was for me. And then going back, I, I, as will probably not surprise many people here, I spent a lot of time at the library as a kid. I really liked it. Um, and, you know, it was convenient for, for parents to have a place your kid really wants to go that's sort of safe and supervised. But it's where I sort of had my earliest transgressions. I broke rules. I, the children's section was great, but I very, you know, quickly realized, well, if I'm alone here, I can sort of like get into the adult section. And around um, nine or so, I, I just like ran in, I grabbed the first book I saw, which had my name on it, which was um, Alexis de Tocqueville's uh, Democracy in America. I thought, great, that sounds wonderful. And I read it, probably didn't understand much of it, but I did get that there was this um, excitement around the founding era and, and that the French were interested in us. It, it was confusing. But then my next foray in, I grabbed something from the same section, which now I realized was just the recent um, you know, releases. And I read Contract with America, and it was very confusing to me. <laughs> um, and then, and then I just sort of needed to understand everything that was going on. And I think from then, I, I, I that was that set me up for that experience in college. And then I just knew that um, I would always have questions that could only be answered by history. Well, you, I think in, in one of your uh, an interview, I saw you mentioned a, a teacher at Santa Barbara, um, Professor Francis Dutra, I yeah. think. And you said uh, years of tutorials with a professor made a historian out of me. What were these twists? Was this the Irish uh, literature and uh, history piece or was this? No, you know, it, what's really interesting is 
I did not, I had very little interest in what Professor Duchin taught, which was Luso Brazilian studies. Um, but I, he was the first one who would give, uh, so these tutorials, which um, are one-on-one -on -one sessions, this is sort of the, the advantage of, of this program. And, um, and professors tended to want to do that because it took a lot of time with older students. And so I didn't really get that audience with that coveted Irish professor who always had people, you know, waiting outside his office the, uh, during office hours um, until I think my junior year. But Professor Dutra in his crammed office, I mean, it didn't have, you know, twists and turns, but because of the way the books were, I just remember having to like navigate through it. He, I, I went to go see him. We had a talk and he said, fine, you know, you come up with your own supplemental, um, you know, syllabus and we'll just meet and we'll talk about it. So I was taking his class and I was also taking a class of my own design, you know, at 18 or 19. And I came in the first day and I remember like basically reading a book report to him. And at the end he said, that's very nice. I can tell you read it. <laughs> and he just, he, he then asked me all these questions and, and that happened every single week, basically for three or four years. I just kept taking whatever class seemed somewhat relevant. Um, and he was just like a lovely man. So it's sort of interesting, but I, all my er, early experiences with, with white male professors were, were actually quite positive. Um, he really, he just, just taught me how to think by the end of it. I didn't realize this at the time, but I did later. He made a grad student out of me, definitely. Well, so in terms of grad school, you went to Columbia and, and uh, Sarah Lawrence, and I know you talk about just kind of the competing uh, impulses of being an academic historian, if we can use that term, and then also public history. And, and when did you sort of become more, more focused on, on the, the public history piece? So much of this is figuring it out along the way. You know, I knew, I, I thought there was only one path available. At the time, history departments really didn't teach you about public history, which is, you know, museums, historical societies, and to a lesser extent, you know, what I do now as an independent historian. There was one path, there was one road, you had know, to be very careful in order to stay on it. But um, I found that it sometimes left me wanting to be more creative or more engaged. And that's why I tried out sort of different programs. And then I happened to live across the street from the Brooklyn Historical Society, offered my services. I very quickly, was, you know, I moved up in the world and in part because I think it was, you know, the financial crisis and they couldn't really afford to turn on lights. So a, a, a hardworking free grad student was, you know, great for them, sorry about that. Um, and and so I, I became an oral historian and then I loved it. I discovered this whole world. A job opened up at the New York Public Library and I was encouraged to apply by my current boss there um, and, or my, my boss at the time. And, and I went into the interview thinking I wouldn't take it because it's like, as you know, jumping off a building, you can't get back in once you leave academia. So I just, I spent the whole interview giving my real opinions on things. You know, the, what, did, what did you think about the exhibition in, in the main hall? I said it really didn't, you, you know, I thought it was very quiet considering the primary sources, you know, and I just, I didn't say it rudely. I just, I really gave my opinion and apparently no one else had. So I got the job. It was too good of an opportunity. I took it and I have zero regrets. But you say also that one of your, uh, your boss there was the one who encouraged you to be a writer and you said it was her praise and encouragement, which meant the world to me. Yes, I, I did. It I mean, did. Did, you, did you like write memos for how did she discover your writing? Yes. So I was in the exhibitions department. I was the research curator, um, which meant that I, I got to spend, you know, two years on a project. So very much like a master's. And I say, which Susan Rabner, the woman who we're talking about, told, you know, I'm stealing her line. She said every exhibition is like a new master's degree. Um, and so I would spend a year on my own with a key that let me into every lock cage of every special collection. So the things that researchers used to have to wait patiently, you know, in the reading room, they're rolled out in a cart. You can't, you get supervised. You only get a certain amount of each time. That was not my world. My world was one of excess. It was one in which I was left alone in a wild west. I'd compile all these ideas. And then, um, you know, we'd work on the exhibition. And my responsibilities at first were that of every research curator who had come before me. There's only one at a time. Um, but I, I would write, you know, 
a bunch of, I would keep the, I would basically curate the exhibition. I would write all these notes. I would write the little panel text that you see around. Um, but I would also sort of like, I didn't really understand it first. So I basically wrote a whole exhibition catalog and submitted it to her to then give to the writing department because the New York Public Library is not your local public library. It's a, you know, called the People's Palace. It's huge, it's well-funded. It gets a million visitors a month during normal time. She loved it. She kept making me write things, didn't understand why we would pass it off to someone who didn't get it. And then she kept telling me, write, do this, take a risk or else you'll end up staying here your entire career. So the funny part about being in public history is it, it has a tenured sort of deal to it. You know, if you find some place you like, there aren't a ton of jobs, you hold on to it for dear life. And when I left, she told me, you're getting out before you're too crazy. <laughs> Well, Alexis, I want to go to your books in a second, but I, I, I want to talk a little bit about your journalism because I was, uh, I was, I, I've read a number of your articles and I love them. And I, I was telling someone, I said, I think Alexis is the only person in the world who has written for the New York Times, the Atlantic, Paris Review, Elle, New Yorker, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Modern Farmer. How did you, <laughs> how did you get the gig at the Modern Farmer and what did you write about? Oh my goodness, lots of strange things. I mean, I think we all like, as I said, good stories. And I, well, I have, you know, I'm a presidential historian. And if you, you notice that everything is about political history, which is where I, I that's what I studied in school. That's where I, I feel like I land. But I like to have fun with things. I'm curious about everything. So I think there was an emu war that that was a long time ago, Modern Farmer. Um, you know, I've written op-eds for the New York Times about very serious things about like lack of access to senators' papers because they can declare them private, which makes it impossible to study these public servants who we pay. Um, then I've also written about, you know, Taft did not get stuck in a bath and it's really, it's fat shaming, it's bath shaming, it's a lot of things we shouldn't be doing. And, you know, funny things for Elle. So I think that the basically, I, I am not a snob. Working at the NYPL taught me that you just want the public to engage with your work. And I got to see them sort of pause, you know, these million visitors, I got to see them pause or walk, you know, walk right by something. And I realized it's not about, of course, we all want to sound like the most intelligent person. We want to, um, we have lofty goals. But when you get rid of all of that, and you just sort of, you know, a, you're really truthful about things. I don't know, you can just have fun with things. And I love history. And when you engage with history and, um, or you engage with anything that you love, you do it in a variety of different ways. And I think that those publications really are emblematic of that. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I do think that it, I, I pitched to places that I felt like um, would reach an audience that would appreciate the work. So less than thinking about what would be good for me or my career, although obviously the times and all those places are great. I just thought about, does this fit? Where does it fit? Because often when you pitch history um, to publications, they want a news peg, they want something, you have to really talk them into it. So it was really, you know, sometimes uh, uh, pitching to six places and the place that took it just happened to be the Paris Review. Shows you just keep trying. Well, one of my favorite essays you wrote was a chronicle for, I think it was a New Republic, about the, the gold rush. And you, yeah. you spent a week with the a reenactors group uh, uh, going west. And, um, and what I like about the essay, I mean, you caught the, uh, the sort of special qualities of your fellow, uh, your fellow participants, not all of whom were totally geared for a really rugged outdoor experience. Um, but you also did it in the context of just the exploration and the drive to you know, seek gold in the California dream. And I wanna read one sentence and kind of have you talk about it. You said, um, and I think what happened at the end of this, you were driving, I think you were living in San Francisco, you're driving home, you're approaching maybe the Golden Gate Bridge, the city's enshrouded in fog, and you, you're thinking about the lessons and you say, you, you can't win if you don't play, winning is luck, losing is quitting. And then you say the final lesson, in the end, the dream betrays you. Remember where you were going? How that dark, <laughs> dark. <laughs> yes, I mean, well, you have to remember that I had much like people who had just traveled from across the country on wagons. I had just traveled from Zephyr Cove, Nevada, down to um, you know around Sacramento at three miles per hour 
for a week. It hailed, it snowed, it was like 101. I had every sort of injury one could have from like, a, you know, a throbbing tooth to calloused and bloody hands. Um, and discovered along the way that it turns out I am, uh, I've never reenacted, I hadn't before, I haven't since. It turns out I'm very serious about it, um, probably more serious than others. I think that was fun. And that was a moment where I realized something um, just to step back which is that it, it's funny to think about it because I had Alice and Fred had just come out to it was not it did, I mean it was critically um, well received it was in the New Yorker but it wasn't at all you know bestseller anything like like you know you never forget your first and um, I had a couple places you know reach out to me and say you know here's this young historian we don't know what she's doing but maybe she has something interesting and I pitched the New Republic what I thought was sort of crazy I had seen that there was this group that did this reenactment every year and they let me do it and then they let me do it and I I still didn't get it I said well I have to write it like a journal entry this is how these things were written and they were like yeah okay so I I just sort of went into it so it's funny because I got to live the dream but I think you know San Francisco California, as we've seen in the last year, um, and you know, for me, my entire childhood, it is like dancing on the Titanic. And I think that it, I always had a really good idea, but I hadn't quite realized it until I was driving back that there are these dreams that we invest in as Americans at a state level, as a national level. And the more invested we get into them, the, the more they betray us. We have to really try and reconcile opportunity um, with opportunity structures and what's best for, you know, ourselves and society as a whole to make it sort of big. But that was, that was obviously a very fun piece that I'm glad is gone and I never want to do it again. Yeah, and I think it actually ran in an, an, an anthology of travel essays. And so, I mean, yeah, it was I the really... best American. It was like a huge, it was, it was really big for me. It was wonderful, but again, never, never again. Once is enough. Huh? Yes. <laughs> well, let's talk about your book, uh, Alice and Fred. Is it Frida or Freda? It's, it's um, everyone says Frida, so I say Frida, but it's Frederica. Um, oh. It'll be interesting, so it will be a movie, so I don't actually know, I guess I'm hedging my bets. I go with whatever the person says, to be totally honest. Um, you know, it, it can go either way. I'm not originally from the South, so I certainly learned quite a bit of things. Um, although they never tell you, you just have to read their face. They're cryptic about it. Um, but if they said something like, bless your heart, whatever you just said is not good. Um, so it, yeah, so Alice and Frida um, was a story I discovered in grad school when I was going about this very serious path and it just sort of needled me. I tried to get people to talk about it or write about it or put an exhibition, nobody wanted it. Fast forward, nobody even to really publish it. It was a small deal um, and then fast forward and Amazon is funding it, it's casting, it's gonna start shooting in the fall. Um, so it, it just shows you that, you know, these are stories we should tell and that it's okay once in a while to tell something that seems sort of out of your wheelhouse. No one's going to, you know, um, make you stick to that for the rest of your life. You can experiment a little bit while still sort of, you know, keeping your focus on something, which I guess it relates to your earlier question of sort of how I write around things while still sort of keeping the big things, um, you know, on track. But what, what I found interesting, I, I think, as you tell the story, you're you're maybe reading some academic journal. You're on the subway. You missed your stop, and two other yeah. or three others, and and I guess the journal was fairly technical and jargony, and dealt with you know identity politics or modernity, and and but you started thinking about the two young women, and you say um, you say, and so I closed my eyes and tried to hear their voices through the dense text to visualize their story briefly tell the story of these two really interesting young women. Oh, that's history, right? Particularly when it comes to women, but in general, you see something and you really need to try and see it, how it looked at the time. And I think that was the thing that was interesting. Um, and it just shows you, again, these are such great stories. That's what happens when you read a novel, you miss your stuff. Um, Alice and Frida were, um, you know, teenagers in 1892 Memphis who did something, who did what a lot of young women did in America, throughout America, but it had a specific name in Memphis called chumming, which is that they sort of played at being together, at dating, because they were preparing for what was called the great drama of their lives, you know, to get married. So they would practice dating, they would practice holding hands, they would write each other love letters. But of course, you know, for some people that was real. 
Um, in Boston, well-to-do women would have something called Boston marriages, which you know, single women would live together if they had control over their money. That was incredibly rare. And so Alice and Frida, they played at this. Al Alice was serious. Frida was not. She was playing at this with like 10 other postmasters. And that's the funny thing about um, America for a long time. Everyone was a postman, you know, master. A little bit played with it, knew someone was related to 20 of them. Um, and she she's going to, you know, so they're going to elope. And Frida's sister discovers this the night before. So again, you cannot make this stuff up. And they're forbidden to speak to each other ever again. Alice thinks they're still going to work it out. They're going to stick to their plan. They're going to run away. She's going to, you know, dress as a man to support Frida in St. Louis, where they're going to get to. Um, and Frida, listen, you know, she's done. She's been caught. This wasn't something she was committed to. I don't know if she would have even gone a step further. Um, but they had a deal. And the deal that they made, like Romeo and Juliet, a lot of other people, they were going to um, kill themselves if they couldn't be together. And Alice took that very seriously and she ends up murdering um, Frida in public with witnesses and wants to kill herself. She doesn't end up doing it because of course she has to be turned in. Her father hires the best men in Memphis, you know, people who would go on to be like governors and such. And they get her off on insanity, not because um, she wanted to, you know, she, she killed Frida, but because she said she loved her and wanted to marry her. And what was amazing to me about that story was it wasn't just about them. I mean, their story was amazing. That's why I wanted to visualize it because it was it was the best vehicle for that really dense academic article book that I was reading at the time. And I needed to bring them out. All of these things are just great ways to talk about other things. And when I say things, I do mean people, you know, Washington, Alice, Fred, or whoever they are, they tell us about our world and our country in really interesting ways. And I don't need people again, to think it's the most important story, the best story, whatever it is. It's just, it's a story that that gets you and they turn around and they tell people about American history as if it belongs to them, which it does. Well, it's funny, Alexis, because when I finished it, I, I, you know, I mean, it was really gripping. And uh, I mean, the story is great. The visuals are amazing. You mm -hmm. have a wonderful collaborator where you have, uh, you know, the, the, the hand, handwritten notes and the returned letter and sketches and all. Um, but I, you know, I thought of, of course, of the two women, but also some of the other people, like one, the friend Lily, who got caught up in it. I, I remember thinking, "Gosh, I wonder whatever happened to Lily and the rest of her life." So many people wonder what happened to Lily. I want someone to find it. You know, the problem with women in history is they go dark. And Alice and Freda, we don't know much about them before then, and we don't know much after Alice dies. From what I think is, and what a family, a descendant um, confirmed a few years ago was suicide. Um, but you know, otherwise they weren't considered remarkable. They were just going to get married. So we don't know a ton about them. And I think that that's what was really, um, that's what's really heartbreaking about certain things because I don't know what happened to Lily, this friend who was folded into this mess, who was sort of, you know, ruined, if you will, in the in the paper simply because she talked to to men and and you know, um, sent letters, which they all did. That sounds scandalous, but it's sort of like crank calling a boy in your class, you know, when you were young. That it happens. Everyone does it, um, and so everyone feels a lot. They feel a lot for Lily. She was just she was an innocent bystander and. She disappears, but I'm hoping at the movie when the movie comes out, someone will tell me what happened to Lily. It's hard. It's just the str the strings are. You know, it would take me my whole life, and I hope I hope it does come about. But I haven't found anything. Okay, well, let's talk about George Washington, and um, you talk about this book, and you say it's you aspire for it to be a giant leap away from hagiography and great man history, and. You point out that, I mean, there's a, a su substantial George Washington lit literature. Most of the books or many of them are pretty thick, oftentimes have the same cover, basically the same title, push the same themes. And you say, by doing all this, they distance us from the man we really ought to know better. Tell us about the George Washington we should know. George Washington is essential to our founding. When people get war, you know, they talk about monuments, statues, names coming down off the sides of schools. Um, I always say, you know, uh, look, if it's a Confederate, you know, general who uh, would otherwise not be known, 
we're okay. But the thing with George Washington is you can take, you can remove him everywhere. You cannot remove him from our founding story. He is essential to it. And the problem with the way that he's been written is not just the way that he's been written. It's that he's been somewhat alienated from us. Um, and we need to know him in order to understand ourselves. His hypocrisies are the hypocrisies that we have been dealing with um, in our own country, you know, for ever, but also particularly in the last year. Um, and, and that broke my heart because people say, you know, they, there are these extremes that exist, I feel like, in our culture in which, you know, people either want celebratory history, that's like the 1776 report, uh, you know, former President Trump's reaction to uh, the New York Times journalistic endeavor, the 1619 um, project, in which everything is great and very fuzzy and not quite correct. Um, in the in the 1776, 1776 report, but of course 1619 has its own issues. Um, or at the other end of the spectrum is cancel culture. And I had a I, 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 not to this is the worst thing to bring up, but um, I have to tell you about something that happened in Twitter, which confirms so much of what I love about. Um, I had big goals. I wanted people who knew about Washington to enjoy it, and people who didn't know anything about it and would never read a presidential biography to enjoy it. And all that came true. But this is an example of what I wanted the most. Um, I said something, I wrote an op-ed um, in January for the Post about how the Republican Party is everything that Washington warned against in his farewell address. And before them, other parties had fallen under that. And someone on Twitter said, I really don't give a what Washington has to say about anything, he owns slaves. And I said, that's exactly why you should care about him. We had sort of a, you know, he sort of wanted to fight. I wasn't willing to fight. I was just like going to engage. That was it. Three weeks later, this man tweets at me and says, I just finished your book. I actually ended up reading it with my elderly mother. We loved it. I learned a lot. Can you suggest other books like it? Wow. That's what our country needs. <laughs> A guy who says he doesn't want to understand what a hypocritical slave owner had to say, and then a few weeks later, is co-reading with his mother. <laughs> it's amazing. So that's why I think we need to understand George Washington. If you have e any reaction across the, you know, that spectrum, you need to understand George Washington. We all do. If we live in this country, and not only this country, he made everyone look bad. Every Napoleon on his deathbed, deathbed said they wanted me to be Washington. So. Again, you know, all of us need to know why. Well, and, and you you take on some of the kind of the, the myths and 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 and, and uh, go after them in an interesting way. You, of course, one of the kind of things that everyone writes is how how uh, overbearing and difficult his mother was. And you, uh, you, you, you give a forward portrait of Mary Washington, but you also write, America loves a self-made man, particularly one who overcomes the manipulations of a petty woman to seize his great destiny. Um, people have, have, <laughs> have, have been really tough on Mary Washington, haven't they? They have, and, that, and that's the thing, uh, you know, she's no different than Martha Washington, who everyone loves. You know, they were both single widows at, at a time with young children and they were doing their best to control property and to um, inhibit roles, uh, you know, inhabit roles that they were told they could not, you know, even showing up at court was very difficult. Um, but Mary Washington was made out to be this terrible person. And a part of it is they were all bending over backwards to deny Washington a story that uh, is very strange because He's a, he, it's a great American story. He was raised by a single mother, like a lot of other presidents. And the reason I thought it was incredible and such a missed opportunity was that Washington is the grandson of an indentured servant. That is an American story. But instead people have wanted this. He was, you know, rich and he was trying to be closer to his rich stepbrother because his mother was a nightmare. She was, she was doing her best but she was not educated. She was born to an indentured servant. But the, the reason this was so important to me is not because I felt like, oh yes, Mary Washington, I must defend her and, and reclaim her, her legacy. It's because it wasn't true. This is one of the first things I noticed is I, I checked you know, uh, Ron Chernow, Joseph Ellis, um, a lot of these other men, because it all, it's all men who have written about Washington. Um, and they, were either citing each other, citing themselves, which you're not supposed to do. You learn that, you know, the first day of, of grad school, or, 
you know, they were, they had read one sentence of a letter uh, and totally manipulated it. And it was at odds with everything else in it. And one of the big things, uh, you know, just to point this out, I, I list a lot of things and I go into it, but one of the big things that really, um, you know, occurred to me early on was uh, they called her illiterate. But then in a biography of Martha Washington, I saw a letter from Mary Washington. I thought, well, if you can write, you're not illiterate. And then I looked into it. And of course, there were tons of letters. And um, Washington at Mount Vernon, you know, had books that he inherited from his mother, Mary, that were annotated, but they were Bibles. They weren't novels. She was not a good writer. And when, sometimes when we call someone illiterate in the past, it is more of a judgment than a factual statement. And I saw that across the board with Mary. So it was just, it wasn't true. And a part of it also is that sometimes when you put Mary in, um, when you tell the truth about something that happened with Mary, Washington doesn't look so great. She actually wasn't wrong. He was wrong. And that's okay because you know what? We are people. We have good days. We have bad days. I would not like everyone to judge me on, you know, a text I sent my mother one day <laughs> versus another. And that's simply true with Washington. We can admit these things about him and still hold these things. You know, we can hold all this stuff at once. I, I believe we're all capable. Well, one thing I loved in the book too, you you, uh, you do so, you, you actually break down his career and lists in ways that are really kind of helpful to just get a kind of a concise summary. But I also loved you you deconstructed a, a letter that he he sent to his step granddaughters, I believe, and so there's this sort of florid 18th century pose prose, and then you add you you put in a couple notes, you know, saying what he meant to say is don't be a reckless flirt, make sure he's really into you, let him come to you get to know your prospective spouse, do a background check. It's easier to love a rich man than a poor man. Be realistic. Life is long, people change. Yeah. I mean, he was, you know, people said, oh, he's too marble to be real. And I kept finding all these very real things that rendered him very unmarble, but they weren't glamorous. They didn't um, exude masculinity, you know, but these sort of boring moments in which you can cobble together oh, this is a man who is speaking a language I understand. I just don't know I understand it. That's my job is to translate that. And so I really tried hard to, um, to shake things up in that way and to show you, you know, they're not, they're just like us, but they're not as foreign as you think they are. Well, one of the most powerful passages in the book, um, and I'm just gonna read it two sentences and have you react. You say, although estates like Mount Vernon are called plantation, plantations, it's a word inflected with gen genteel romanticism. If we look at what actually occurred them, we see them for what they were, forced labor camps. Um, and also play off the notion that Washington not only had slaves, but he was at times a pretty, uh, pretty tough slave owner who, who punished his, his slaves quite harshly. You, you, it's interesting you would point out that um, that is a moment. I, I rewrote that an awful lot, that sentence in that paragraph. You will not find that in another Washington book. Um, but it is true. And a problem is we do have these genteel inflections, and we think, um, you know, pe until recently, people got, you know, and recently being a year or two ago, I could not visit a plantation without seeing someone getting married, um, seeing sort of this, this view, you know, these, these parties and, and different things to celebrate this sort of old culture that we have, which is lovely in a lot of ways and has really, you know, attractive elements, but again, has this other part and we have to hold those two things at once. And Washington, you know, people talk about slavery in a chapter usually, and they call it a plantation or worse, they call him a planter or a gentleman farmer. Gentleman farmer does not um, bring to mind uh, the president of the United States, the hero of the revolution, assaulting an enslaved man because he cannot move an entire log by himself. And it, we have to do that. We also have to really present him, not in a chapter dealing with slavery, but throughout, because that was his world. You know, if you look at the, the five letters Washington wrote in a day, a good deal of them have to do with slavery, sometimes more than they have to do with Hamilton or the revolution or, you know, establishing a cabinet. And I think that that is um, something that was really important to me. And because the book is short 
And because I really wanted it to be different, I chose my words carefully and, and you just have to say things sometimes. So I say that a plantation is, you know, I describe all the things. And when it comes to Indians, first people, indigenous people of this country, you have to just say what it was, which was genocide. Alexis, you talk a lot about uh, Washington as, as a military leader during the revolution and, and you know, point out that you know, he, uh, you know, he sort of played a game of survival, lost more battles than, than, than he won. But uh, I love the way that you talked about just his work as basically, I think, Agent 711. He was a spy, basically a spy master, um, was very shrewd in terms of orchestrating public opinion and propaganda. So he, Washington was fighting a shrewd multi-front war. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I also, I was, um, I appear in, and I was a producer on Doris Kearns Goodwin's Washington series. And I, I think about, you know, an argument I had with the writers there for about three weeks, which was they wanted to start with um, Lexington and Concord. And I said, he wasn't there. <laughs> he was like a year before he was even the general. So we can't, we can't do that. And I think the problem with the revolution and particularly with Washington is everyone wants to um, stake their claim and say the thing and they talk about all the battles, but that, you know, Washington was not on the front lines. That's not what a general does um, quite often. And, um, and so I, I, was, I was really taken with this idea that like, what was he doing the rest, when he wasn't at that battle, when Benedict Arnold won that battle, when other people won that battle, what was he doing? Um, and it also introduced, introduced me to this whole world in which we had denied Washington a good amount of um, diplomacy and uh, intellectual um, credit that he should have received by sort of focusing on these, these other things. And um, it also plays against one of these myths that we know about Washington, which is that, you know, he could not tell a lie. Well, if he couldn't tell a lie, he would have been a terrible spy master. And if he had been a terrible spy master, which he like enjoyed too, and we need to see him enjoying things just as we need to see him assaulting an enslaved person um, for you know an impossible task. And and I really wanted him to come alive. He loved it, he enjoyed it, and he was good at it. And it was a huge part of our win, right? Not we can't really, you know, we can never quantify the works of spying. That's the whole point. We're not really supposed to know, but we do know that, you know. We should not have won that war for a lot of different reasons. And one of them is, you know, we didn't have a Navy. They had the best Navy in the world. We hardly had boats and we didn't have um, the manpower or the resources, but we did know the terrain. We did have networks and that can't be underestimated. And Washington's public opinion, his like battle for that, making sure everyone knew how well we were treating the British soldiers and the Hessians, the, the mercenaries that they hired in comparison to how the British were because they refused to acknowledge this as a um, revolution and said they kept calling it a rebellion. So they didn't have to follow any rules. They just got to put it down. Um, that then later makes sense. Well, why did they want him to be president? It wasn't just that he gave up power, which obviously is a very big thing. We, we knew that then, we definitely know that now. But it was also because he had a lot of skills that we normally give, um, you know, credit to someone like Jefferson Adams and such. So it sort of again just makes him more interesting and explains a lot about how things went. And I think you do also a masterful job about talking about Washington as president, because as you're pointing it out, I mean, he's making stuff up. I mean, there are no rules and uh, he's trying to figure it out. And in your view, he had a very successful first term far less so successful second term. In fact, you said, you know, it was not so much he was uh, agreed, but he, he capitulated to a second term. Um, do you think, and you even suggest that maybe his legacy was hurt by some of the errors of the second term. Do you think he would have been better off personally and the country would have been better off had he just left after one term and maybe John Adams came in? Or do you think it was necessary mm -hmm. for a second term, even if it wasn't greatly successful, to consolidate what that which had been achieved. It's it, you know, when you, as you know, when you read someone's letters in the archives, you have to believe them and also not believe them. So Washington throughout his life has these opportunities when he, in which he says, no, I couldn't possibly, but he really wants it, right? Obviously he's ambitious, anyone who, who um, ascends, and that's not bad, ambition is not a bad thing. But, um, you know, Washington showing up at the, at the you know, when, when we're about to, to sign the Declaration of Independence where he stuffs himself in his old military uniform that he has not worn in decades, that's Washington saying, I wanna do this. 
when Washington, um, he doesn't want to be president. He, he describes going to the inauguration as like going to his execution. He knows he has everything to lose. At the same time, I don't think he could have been a bystander. I think he would, he, did, he, was, he didn't have good choices, in other words, you know. We, we always talk about, I always think about things in terms of choices and, you know, he, he, in his, he had to do it. We would have fallen apart. He was the unifying person. He went to the Constitutional Convention. The only reason we got rid of the Articles of Confederation, I'm sort of convinced, is he was there and people were like, yeah, okay, we're looking at the president. We can leave it. We trust him. We don't know if he'll do everything correctly, and he didn't, but we do know that he can be trusted with power, with all these other things that literally no one else can. 10 years after our revolution, you know, he was president 10 years after the French revolution inspired by our own, Napoleon was installed. They had killed their monarchs. We had just ejected ours, you know, in, in absentia. Um, so it was very different. So I think that he understood that it, unity and stability had to happen. Um, and he, just like he sort of, he gained a lot and he lost a lot. He, he did okay, but you know, he went in and I make a chart because I really want to hit home. He went in with all the founders thinking he was the greatest man in the world. And by the, you know, saying all these things and, and people who weren't founders, Thomas Paine, people who had been really instrumental to hearts and minds campaigns. By the end of it, these were some of the rudest, they said the rudest things about him. And he was estranged from almost all of them, except for Adams, who he never really, you know, that set up the vice president as being somewhat irrelevant. Um, and uh, Hamilton, who had left in after the first term, but still very much stayed involved and got him in a little bit of trouble. But um, yeah, absolutely. I think I think we needed him. But I think it was one of the most uh, it was probably the most unpleasant eight years of his life and also very bad for Martha. She did not like it at all. And she she wrote this very revealing letter about how sometimes, you know, she thinks their arrangement wasn't totally fair and that probably the role of first lady, which was not called that. Um, would be better for someone who like really wanted it and enjoyed it um, and was younger. They were also, you know, that that photo, that image we have of her in our mind, that portrait of, of the bonnet and the old lady, that's not Martha for most of her life. She was vivacious, she was fun, she, and when she was younger, she was, you know, considered a great beauty. So it wasn't, it aged them, it wasn't fun, it depleted their bank account, uh, it lost some friends and they had to be away from Virginia for a long time. And worst of all, they had to be in New York for a few years, which they really didn't like. Right. Well, let's talk maybe more broadly about the historical profession and, and how you see it and how you want to, you know, focus your career. And you've described, well, I mean, there's sort of like a, an academic piece, you know, with scholars writing, sometimes heavily jargon laden prose, sometimes kind of hyper specialization. There's a genre which you talk about as kind of the Father's Day uh, historians who you know crank out the eight or nine hundred page books that you give to your dad and hope they open it up him up <laughs> at least yeah. briefly. Um, right. And then you talk about a realm that you want to work in at least part of the time, which is micro history. Talk about what what that means to you. Micro history. I mean, in a way, Alice and, and Frida is micro history. Um, the the Hemings of Monticello and that great reads. Uh, great contribution, one of them, um, is microhistory. Erica Armstrong Dunbar, who wrote, I think, one of the only other interesting books about Washington <clears throat> out there right now, um, called Never Caught, the story of Ona Judge, um, a, an enslaved woman who the Washingtons pursued almost up to his death, um, which then I think uh, is a very persuasive, um, you know, one of them uh, argument against this this grand story that Mount Vernon and other people like to tell. And I love Mount Vernon. I've spent the night there. We have a sort of we're in we're in round fifteen of this. We really, you know, it's it's good. It's good for scholarship. But you know, I think that they tell a very celebratory, generous story. Um, micro histories are usually about three hundred pages. And they manage to tell the story of the man, whether it's Jefferson, Washington, whoever, along with the story of Sally Hemings and um, you know Ona Judge and, and all these other people, in a way that really carries you through. And so I try to bring. It's so exciting. It's accessible, um, and it 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 lets us get away from this sort of. Um, ac I, my first drafts are all academic. I'm always told that, but it helps us let loose a little bit. We tend to and and Washington biographies of the West Defenders, but presidential and political history do, they tend to sort of proceed in the, in the same way. They're not, they don't play around with form very much. 
micro histories do. Um, and so I want to take that sensibility and bring them to presidential biographies. And I will say, <laughs> I, you know, I looked at your, your notes for, for Washington and I mean, you did some amazingly deep and thorough scholarship. So it's, you, I mean, you do all the work, but as you say, you don't have to show all of your work. And I think sometimes with these big histories, there's almost a compulsion to say, okay, I spent years in the archives, so I need to drudge up every document that I came across just to kind of show others that I've, I've done the work. Oh, and it's so painful. I get that. I get it. It's so painful. You don't know. You, you think, okay, can I, can I work this into an end note? Can I, I learned all the battles to forget them. That wasn't fun for me. <laughs> And not, you know, the whole process and, and, you know, but I don't deserve a medal. This is what I've, I've decided to do with my life. And, and I think there is a lot of discipline, like with, you know, we all have these moments we want to write an email making every single point. And then we realize it's far more effective to make two points um, and erase the rest. And that's just how life has to be here. Um, and so I do, I aspire to bring so many of those things into presidential history. And I can't write all of these, you know, I can't rewrite all the, the presidential biographies and books, but um, what I can do is sort of open this up for people. Um, and so I also hope by embracing micro histories that I make people who write micro histories think that they should be writing presidential biographies. And so far it seems to be working. Um, so many women have asked me to help them get book deals and it's been really successful so far, agents, um, you just see people feeling more comfortable in this territory. And, and you know, I know it's, it's sometimes tempting to say, okay, well, they're focusing a lot on gender and color. Diversity isn't just for diversity's sake. It's because whenever we come to something with just one perspective, we don't see certain things. And in the archives, you know, as I've said, we, we have to translate a lot of things. We also have to be able to see it. We can't do that if we don't have a variety of experiences and we don't have colleagues um, pointing these out. The thing is with Washington books, it's been entirely white men. I am the first woman historian to write a biography in hundred years. And the other two were 40 years ago, these other two women, and they were a journalist and a, you know, a, um, a, a travel writer, I believe. And so, you know, we need to get other historians in there um, to look at this. It just has to happen. And it should happen. And some of this has to do with changes in our world, right? Women weren't in history departments 40 years ago. People of color weren't. Now it's a little bit better not as much as it should be, but I'm hoping that it does because we just get better history, more history. And it's not like those op those initial options are disappearing. We're just adding more. Tell us about the work as a historical consultant, say with the History Channel, What? how does that work? I mean, are you brought, I know you were, you were involved with Doris on this Washington project, but is it, are they sort of going around and saying, you know, is this true? Is this accurate? You know, read a script or how does that work? As far as, I mean, I only have a few experiences, but as far as I know, it's really different every time. It's fascinating to work on the other side. I'm sure you've sat for a lot of documentaries as I have, and I, so much makes sense now about the way they ask you questions about all of it. So I'm so glad that I had this experience. Um, I think, you know, for for the movie, the screenwriter and I took a retreat to Memphis. We walked around, we talked, we walked through the book, we had breakfast every day, and that was the extent of it. And then I sort of, you know, I got questions once in a while and that was it. And a part of it is I want to respect a different medium. I'm not really involved. But the Washington series, Doris, I didn't think I had time. Doris invited me out to drinks, which of course I was like, I didn't know her. So of course I said, yes, I would love to have drinks with Doris Kearns Goodwin. About two seconds in, I was, I was, I was hers. Um, and what she wanted me to do was to be in the room, which I think is unusual. They, the History Channel said they've never done that. And they also don't have a lot of women um, in general. Um, and so I was in there for a whole summer, three days a week, arguing, suggesting reading, you know, talking to um, three writers who had written different series, but were not historians and had never worked in this, um, you know, in early America, I think one had worked on um, something to do with Churchill uh, for CNN. So they were, you know, some of them had worked in history, but not this. So I was there and I was sort of, uh, you know, having these arguments like Lexington and Concord shouldn't be in here because it's about Washington, or if it is, it's two seconds. And I don't know if you want to 
use the budget for a reenactment for two seconds of something he wasn't at. Um, and then sometimes I would have to like sidebar with Doris who would come in and out. She was on the leadership tour. Um, and then after what I decided was I needed, they knew me too well and they enjoyed, you know, I was there. And so one of my favorite documentary, documentary editors, um, a documentary editor is someone who worked at presidential papers. So John Adams, Washington, mostly the founders, but also, you know, Obama, any of these people. And they process um, all the materials, they help researchers, and sometimes they do some freelance work. And I had absolutely loved um, Bill Ferraro, who I worked with, who, you know, was at my daughter's uh, first Zoom birthday party, you know, uh, last summer. Now I think of him as family. I invited him on because I know um, he is obviously wonderful. I feel very close to him, but he is mean in his comments and exacting because he needs to be. He creates these leather bound, you know, 5,000 page volumes that you cannot buy unless you're incredibly wealthy. You have to go use them in a library. And so I brought him on to sort of back me up on a lot of things and also just fights that I didn't want to fight, you know, things that were just true or not true. And, um, and that was wonderful. And so I think that that might, there are fact checkers. I think that my experience was somewhat unusual. And then there were points where, you know, I was being interviewed and I was also, you know, feeding myself questions and I got to one of my crowning achievements I think is I, um, I I suggested all the historians and I got so many people in there that you do not normally see I got um, you know another young woman in there who had not had a book or a lot of experience yet I got um, you know, Erica Dunbar was in there. I made sure that things that should be described by people of color were described by people of color. People, things that should be described by military experts should be described by military experts. Sometimes there's the there's the tendency to bring someone in and just ask them everything. But because we work in the same field, I would know if they couldn't speak to something or they could. So I feel like I got to, I'm not sure what I was, I was brought in to be there in the room and then I just kept sort of being in the room. Um, and it was really fun for me. I always say I lost a lot, you know, I lost a lot of battles like Washington, but I also, I, I won a lot and I'm very, I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it. Definitely. It was exciting. And then it came out around the same time as, as the books, which um, some people thought that I had planned, but it was just a beautiful gift from the <laughs> universe. <laughs> Well, Alexis, you, you wrote uh, an essay on presidential biographies, and I want to read a couple of sentences to maybe expand on it. You say, presidential biographies don't tell you that everything is going to be okay, but rather that nothing was ever really okay to begin with. And for hundreds of years, Americans not only survived heartbreaking, backbreaking periods, but also stood tall on them. My advice for these divisive times is to find the perspective that history gives. Expand one of on the, that. Yeah, I mean, one of the gifts of being the, the daughter of a boomer <laughs> is that I think I, I have grown up with this, um, who, who, you know, was the daughter of an immigrant. So I'm, you know, not that removed, but I, I, um, I have grown up in an America that is, you know, the, the biggest thing that happened during my childhood was Clinton was impeached and we had, you know, the, the first Iraq war. Those were the things that defined my childhood, but we have never known um, the kind of strife that we see happening in other countries. And we've never known the violence, which is why um, we think of ourselves as being exceptional, why it's so shocking to see what happened at the Capitol. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, that I, that essay I wrote for the New York, um, for the New York Times Magazine, right after, um, right after uh, Trump was elected. I think it was like February and, of 2017 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I, I wrote it, I think, you know, a month earlier or whatever. And it was because this, and in the, in the book, I mean, the, the essay reveals quite a lot about me, which is that I'm constantly giving friends books, micro histories and other things, usually micro histories, but there was a great, um, very short biography. And I, you know, one of, I think maybe two options in the, in the whole world on Chester A. Arthur, a president probably, many people never think about. And um, I introduced the story because the, you know, he was Garfield's uh, vice president and Garfield was assassinated. Um, well, he was shot and then his doctors kind of assassinated him for the next four months, depends on who you who listen to. 
Chester Arthur was never supposed to be president and he became it. Everyone feared that he would, it would just be a huge grift. It wasn't. He got there and everything changed. He did well. He corresponded with a woman in Brooklyn. Nothing made sense who, because she was the only one who believed in him. But so my point was not that that would happen with Trump, but that it's all surprising and, and the world always feels like it's going to hell. And it's very comforting to read this, but it also tells us a lot about our history and our own, um, we think of ourselves as infallible as a country, we're not, it has never really, you know, it's always a grand illusion. Um, and so I love them in that way. And also they have just incredible stories about our country and they make life meaning, feel meaningful on a daily basis. And um, so that was like a lot, it's a letter recommendation. I think of it as a love letter to presidential biographies. And I mean, the ones that drive me crazy too. Well, let's, let's talk for a sec about the project you're now working on, a, a book on JFK. Tell us about what you want to do. And how, I mean, I, it must be some, somewhat frustrating to put it mildly with COVID keeping maybe the Kennedy Library shut in terms of going through the, the archives and all. But tell us what you want to do with JFK. Well, that's interesting. So I, um, I was pulled off book tour. I had, as you, as you said, I had a few really excellent weeks. I'm not complaining, but, um, you know, it's been a strange time because I didn't really get that period after a book comes out to then, you know, go and explore and think about things. Um, so I had a bunch of ideas, but I couldn't follow up on them because the archives are closed. However, if you go to a place like the JFK library, um, they have a ton digitized, they're well-funded. And I knew that because I have been working on Kennedy stuff actually for quite a long time. Um, I would write things now and then, and people would think that they were, uh, it's a, a little bit like Washington, the way that like people are um, ensorcelled, right? A little bit with Kennedy. And um, so I would write something that I'd end up in every Kennedy series. And so I'd be coming around to this for a long time and I, ha I had questions. And then I just sort of kept bumping it up as the year went on and it was clear that I was not going to get into the archives. And I was also waiting for um, a book that I had very high hopes for by Frederick Logeval. Um, and it, it's very good, but it's not the book I would write um, called JFK and it's you know, uh, 1917, I think to 1957. Now, as our you know, esteemed moderator here knows because he wrote a book on JFK in the Senate, there is not a ton that has been written about young um, Jack. And that is the focus of my book because I always felt like everything I learned about the presidency, I would see like a sparkle in his earlier life, but it was either the way it had been handled was sort of like sort of nuts. There was one book that was, that made all these, that was so good. And then it would make these leaps and it would make these leaps and the, and the person who wrote it was actually barred from, from writing another volume. Um, or the next version of this Logeval, which was very good, but like not in some ways and ask questions, some of the same questions where I don't wanna ask those questions anymore. For example, Profiles in Courage, um, which JFK won the Pulitzer for. Everyone is obsessed with this idea of authorship and Logeval came in and he said, you know, that's not the point. The point is everyone did this. Everyone had someone else write it. And I think these are the least interesting questions to ask about Profiles in Courage, Profile in Courage. So I, I I basically, it's the weirdest proposal I've ever written because it wasn't a proposal. I wrote about my experiences with JFK and how over these years, I keep asking these questions and seeing these connections and knowing it's there, but not having that made for me. And so I'm gonna have to do it. Um, and that's all I can tell you right now because I sold it in the, the waning days of 2020. And I, um, you know, just at that early stage where anything can happen and I have, I don't even know where I'm gonna start, but it's pretty exciting. Um, and so I, I'm excited to, to introduce someone who I also do feel like everyone knows who JFK is and they have more that they know about him than, than you know, Washington, definitely. But I, I don't think they really get him. And, and there are interesting parallels between his life and Trump. And I just think if we're going to keep having wealthy men from these families come up, we need to understand what to look out for in both sense, in both ways. So, and I don't know if we're done with the Kennedys to be totally honest. I don't think we've seen the best offerings lately but I do think we have some interesting things coming up ahead. So I think it'll be um, another book about America really but also about this person who's quite incredible. 
The one thing that struck me when I heard about you're working on this is I think, you know, unlike Washington, where I, I think you're right that there is this kind of monolithic literature with Kennedy. And I, in fact, I, when I was talking about my book, I had a, a, a talk that I called the endless quest to say something new about JFK. Yeah. And it seemed like sure. everyone was trying to find a new angle because, you know, you have a relatively short life. And so there was this frantic search, you know, JFK conservative, JFK liberal, you know, right and just all sorts of slicing and dicing. So I will be very eager to see uh, how you pull it together. Well, Alexis, finally, tell us what you like to do when you can uh, unwind and relax. I know you have a small daughter who probably takes up a fair amount of your, uh, your uh, psychic energy. Tell us about your life in Brooklyn. Uh, um, well, you know, what it is now, <laughs> um, I, my husband is a, an editor at Wired. Um, and we, so we live a very like Brooklyn based life, but I am a Californian and would love to return to it. Um, I, I, you know, take lots of walks and listen to podcasts and um, I do love anything to do with history. And I think my, my pandemic binges have been maybe on, um, I have watched uh, What's My Line, which is on Hulu and, and Netflix and I highly suggest it's an old, old show. And, um, I have just been, you know, baking different things from history, d depression era, chocolate, one bowl, you know, cakes. I believe snacking cakes should be a, a way of life. And um, I listen to, I, I, I do love to take like a constitutional and listen to either oral histories, like, um, like Jackie's oral histories with Schlesinger, really interesting and um, or podcasts. And I don't listen to, um, once in a while I'll listen to like Crooked Media or these big podcasts or the daily, but for the most part, I like really bad quality, um, you know, history podcasts because they're never that popular. Except I will plug one that is very good and the quality is very good and I'm sort of shocked at it. One of um, the, uh, a woman, named Catherine Gerard, who um, graduated from the same graduate program as me and works at the Washington Papers, has a podcast that she's made called uh, Your Most Obedient Servant, which is how the founders sign their names. And it is all about primary sources and it is so much fun. She has, um, you know, she'll unpack a, a, a letter that um, Maya Randolph, uh, Jefferson's granddaughter sent about going to a ball and everyone's wearing like grills, sort of like what we, um, you know, associate with like rappers, like they're getting their teeth shaved down because it's in style and she hates everyone. And, and so she basically, Catherine will unpack these things and I've loved listening to her. Great. Alexis, well, th thank you so much. It's been great uh, to have you with us and we would love to, uh, entice you out to Carbondale, Illinois sometime when time permits and I would uh, love it. meet students and see the area and talk to classes. And, uh, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm waiting uh, very excitedly for your Kennedy book to come out because uh, you know, I, I just was really s deeply impressed by the, 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 the two books that we've been talking about. They're really r remarkable and fun reads. I mean, they're really interesting. So I would urge all of our audience to go out and buy these books. So Alexis, thank you so much thank and let's so. stay in touch. Yeah, thank you, thanks, wonderful. Great, and thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We will have this uh, interview on YouTube in the next couple of days. Please look at it and send it to your friends. And thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much. <laughs>